Good evening everyone and welcome to our last week of our CCNA Security Short Course. So this evening we're going to look at uh, crypto, so a little bit of theory of crypto and we're going to look at VPN, different types of VPN and uh, primarily site-to-site -site VPN and we're going to look at a, a quick lab at the end, another packet shaper lab that uh, just steps through the process of setting up a point-to-point -point VPN between two routers when using a shared infrastructure. Okay, so lesson objectives, we're going to try and describe the purpose and operation of VPNs in general, differentiate between the various types, describe the IPsec protocol and its basic functions, differentiate between AH and ESP and those terms will become clearer later on, describe the Ike protocol and modes and describe the five steps of IPsec operation. So what is a VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and basically, I think I might have mentioned this last week, it's basically just a network that, a private encrypted network that is set up over some shared infrastructure. So if we look at this diagram here, if I just turn my little spotlight on for a second, we have the internet here represented by this cloud, we have a WAN link here and we have a VPN which you know this one's probably this one's representing an MPLS VPN um, by the way it's been labeled but if we look at the internet here we've got a small office home office Cisco DSL router has a VPN encrypted tunnel set up between here and the head office here okay over the internet you've got a mobile worker with a Cisco VPN client yes I know Cisco VPN client is the end of life now um, but just an example these are just examples you've got a business partner with a Cisco router no VPN there so it just comes in through the internet and we've got a regional branch with a VPN enabled router okay so really this is labeled as WAN but it, it should just you know come through the same uh, position as the internet and all of those have connections, all of those VPNs are allowed through the firewall, terminate on, uh, on this router here and then through the firewall into your corporate network. Now one of the reasons with this particular diagram we've got the VPN terminate on the router here, so that's where the encryption stops and then it's passed through the firewall and clear text to enable um, your firewall to be able to see the traffic. Uh, however, that could also be terminated directly on the firewall, that would be equally valid. Okay, so two keys for it, it's virtual, so it's information within a private network, transport over a public network, and it's private, the traffic is encrypted to keep the data confidential, so they're the two things you need to really get from that, okay, it's virtual, so it uses public network, um, but it's a private network over a public infrastructure, and it's private, so it's encrypted. So layer 3 VPNs, uh, multiple types, um, and we're not going to go into too much detail on the first two, but certainly the third one we're going to look at in a bit of detail. So we can use generic routing encapsulation, MPLS or IPsec, and that's all I really want to say on that at the moment, just to show you that there's three different versions. Um, you won't be tested in the CCNA security exam on GRE or MPLS, but there are components of IPsec in there. So VPN types, what have we got? We've got, but basically there's, there's really only the two types. And again, my diagram here is a little bit old, so we've got remote, but what we're trying to show is the two different types of VPNs. So it's simply remote access VPNs and site-to-site -site VPNs. Okay, they're the two main types. Um, now remote access VPNs, this one, uh, this particular site is talking about VPN client, which as I said is now indated. So really we're talking about either Cisco AnyConnect, which we'll talk about a bit later on, or uh, SSL VPNs. In terms of remote access and your site to site are still using your IPsec. Uh, now they can be uh, created using a router a, of various different types, so whether it's an ISR, a DSL router, whatever it is, doesn't big or small, um, they can be also firewalls as well. Um, so there's a number of different ways, a number of different devices that you can use to terminate or initiate your VPNs. So a site-to-site -site VPN, hosts on these networks just send and receive normally, send it through their local gateway, it is then encrypted across the public infrastructure to the other end, decrypted and then sent 
either through the firewall or into, depending on where your termination point is, if it's at the firewall, sent into your network to route as per normal. So a properly configured VPN should actually be totally transparent to the end user. They shouldn't even know, they shouldn't even need to worry about it. So remote access VPNs are a little bit different. Oh, whoops. Okay, in that, uh, the remote worker will have to either use an SSL, uh, so a web browser, SSL VPN. Uh, any connect is actually completely transparent to the user, and we'll talk a bit that, uh, about that a little bit later on, but it's, it's more like the site-to-site -site VPN in that uh, the end user won't even know that they're it won't even have to do anything. It'll automatically connect them to their remote office once they have an internet connection, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in detail. So IPsec versus uh, SSL. What are the differences? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Okay, so from an SSL perspective, if we look at applications as our metric, uh, SSL, web-based applications, file sharing, email, if not using a full client like Outlook, with the full AnyConnect client, which we'll talk about later on, all IP-based applications similar to IPsec are available. Okay, so if you're using SSL-based VPN, then it's mainly web-based applications and file sharing. Um, with the AnyConnect client, which is part of the CCNA security curriculum, uh, you can use pretty much anything. With IPsec, so the point-to-point -point VPNs, all IP-based applications available to the user and the experiences like being connected to your local network, whether that's wired or wireless. So as far as encryption strength is concerned, SSL has a moderate range of key lengths, IPsec a stronger range of longer key lengths, so longer the key, the, more, the stronger it is. Uh, authentication, SSL moderate, one-way or two-way authentication at most, IPsec strong, two-way authentication using shared secrets or digital certificates. Okay. Ease of use, SSL, high, very high. Uh, IPsec, moderate, can be challenging for non-technical -technical users and deployment is more time consuming because you have to deploy uh, configured architecture in order to get your site-to-site -site VPNs up and you need to know what you're doing with that. Um, using an SSL VPN is relatively straightforward. As long as you've got a web browser, you can use it. Overall security, Moderate, any device can initially connect, that's true, but obviously there's other secondary security mechanisms in place to, to stop anyone from getting in. Uh, IPsec, strong security, only specific devices with specific configurations, such as a VPN client, can connect. And we'll see later on as we go through how IPsec works, how it's very specific with the requirements for um, key distribution, encryption, hash algorithm, authentication method and the way that keys are exchanged. Okay, if, certain param if all those parameters don't match on both ends, then the um, encryption won't uh, come up. Okay, so if we look at our VPNs, okay, so we've got flexible platform, resilient clustering, clientless VPNs, or AnyConnect, okay, are our options. So in other words, you can use any platform, uh, as long as you've got a web browser, you can use an SSL VPN. Uh, of course, it goes to the clientless and any connect as well. So VPN infrastructure for contemporary applications. Okay, so if you've got uh, applications that you've co-written in-house, or you know you've got specific applications that you use that aren't web-enabled, then IPsec VPNs really are the way to go. Okay, so IPsec topology. So IPsec works at the network layer, protecting and authenticating IP packets. So it protects it via um, your encryption and authenticates through a number of different mechanisms which we'll go through uh, shortly. So IPsec is a framework of open standards and they're algorithm independent. Okay? Um, it provides data confidentiality, so, so secrecy. In other words, you've got your encryption. Data integrity which is provided through your hashing, so that means basically that your data isn't changed during transit, and origin authentication, which basically means I know who sent it to me and they know who I am. Okay, so both ends are aware of each other and you can prove who each is, other is. So IPsec framework, so this is um, basically how IPsec looks from a, a protocol point of view. 
and it's built on a nice little stack here. So it's a bit like the OSI reference model in a way. So we start with Diffie-Hellman and we'll have a look at these each a little bit more in depth. Um, we have our authentication, pre-shared key or RSA. Integrity is provided by MD5 or SHA has, SHA hashing. Confidentiality in pro, provided by our various means of encryption. And IPsec, AH, ESP or ESP plus AH headers. Okay, and we'll have a look at those again um, shortly. So in terms of confidentiality, um, we have a continuum of least secure to most secure. A DES is, has a key bit length of 56 bits and is generally considered, uh, you wouldn't use that too often um, nowadays. It's um, considered to be 56, key, 56 bits in a key length is not considered to be particularly secure. Triple DES uses 56 key bit as well, but it performs the encryption algorithm three times, thus uh, encryption of encryption of encryption. Um, so significantly altering the security level provided. Um, and probably the, the highest level that you guys, most of you guys will have seen is AES, Advanced Encryption um, System. So key length, 128 bits is the shortest, up to 256 bits. Okay, now um, the benefits in using the different key lengths uh, are sometimes offset depending on the hardware and its capability to actually encrypt. But um, you know, 128 bits is still very secure key length. Um, 256 is obviously extremely secure. And a seal, which um, I've not really done much with that either. So, and that's not particularly one that's worried about. It's just in the in terms of the CCNA security exam, it's merely on here to represent another possibility, and it's got a key length of 160 bits. So if we look at our integrity, again on the continuum of least secure to most secure, MD5 hashing and SHA hashing. Um, again, MD5 uses a key length of 128 bits, SHA uses 160 bits. Uh, SHA stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm. Um, now MD5, you know, it's been well recorded that there are, it is possible to um, launch an attack against it and find uh, discover uh, keys um, in terms of collisions. So what you're basically looking for is we we do a, um, a hash on a particular value over and over again, and then we have a, replace it with another value, and another value, and another value, another string of characters or whatever we think the passphrase is, and eventually you know we'll get a collision to show that okay this one matches the same as what the the key length is here. Um, it's still long odds to actually be able to do that, but it is possible technically. Um, some people see that as a weakness. Uh, I'm yet to see any serious evidence of it being a, a, a weakness for the vast majority of people. Okay, authentication, pre-shared key or RSA signatures. Simple as that. And Diffie-Hellman Secure Key Exchange. So Diffie-Hellman sits down at the bottom layer of IPsec and basically is responsible for uh, exchanging the initial encryption keys, and you'll see how this works in a minute, um, using these Diffie-Hellman algorithms. So DH1 is least secured, DH7 is more secure. There's no real need to go into any depth about what those algorithms are, just be uh, mindful of the fact that there are Diffie-Hellman algorithms which are involved in secure key exchange and that's as far as you need to take it for the purposes of the CCNA exam. So IPsec framework protocols. So we have, and this goes back to um, our this goes back to our slide uh, right back at the start when we first started having a look at the breakdown of IPsec. So we have authentication header and we have encapsulated security payloads, so AH and ESP. These are two methods, these are two frame types for IPsec. Okay, so AH authentication header provides the following. Authentication, as could be derived from the name, and integrity, which means, okay, um, data hasn't been changed in transit. However, all data is sent in plain text. ESP, the data payload is actually encrypted, so ESP is ob obviously more uh, secure. So ESP provides encryption and again authentication integrity. So that encryption really is also confidentiality. So there's your three 
points of your CIA triangle, confidentiality, integrity, and, and um, sorry, it's not the third one. Third one's availability, not authentication. Okay, so Ike, Internet Key Exchange. So the first part in any IPsec um, discussion or communication is that end hosts must decide, must determine uh, what policies they're going to use to exchange their keys. Okay, so exchange their passphrase or their credentials, you might say. And this happens using ICE, Internet Key Exchange Protocol. And there's two phases to it. So phase one, the steps are thus. The first step is to negotiate the Internet Key Exchange policy sets. Okay, and policy sets are basically a list of attributes which the, both sides will agree to use. So in this case, they've agreed to use, so if I use my spotlight again, in both cases they've decided to use DES encryption, MD5 hashing, they're going to use a pre-shared key using Diffie-Hellman 1 algorithm and the Security Association lifetime value. Okay, which we'll explain that more in detail in a minute. So once they've decided that, okay, we both agree on what policy we're going to use, and incidentally the statement of the top policy 10, policy 15, is just a number identifying that policy. So that's a, a naming, that's a name basically, or a naming convention for the policy on the particular configuration of each router. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It just means this is policy 10, this one's policy 15, they happen to match. And we'll see how that works a little bit later on in the slides. Okay, so once they've decided that they're going to, they've agreed on what they're actually going to use, uh, then they do the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Okay, so they exchange the key using the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. They then verify the peer identity, so we'll say, all right, I'm, so they verify that you're router 1, router 1 will verify that this one is router 2. So that's your IC phase 1. So that's actually just the exchange of keys to actually set up the IPsec. So this is before IPsec has even been um, initiated. And then IC, IC Internet Key Exchange Phase 2 is about negotiating the IPsec policy. And again, the settings have to match for it to work. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So Phase 1, first exchange. We have Policy 10 here, DES, MD5, Pre-Shared, DH1, Lifetime SA. Okay, this one on this side, so basically router 1 will make a proposal of policy 10 to router 2. Router 2 will look through its policies that it has configured and if it's got a matching one it'll say sure, I've got that, that's what I'm proposing, alright we're all good to go. Now you'll see router 1 has two policies set up, whereas router 2 only has one policy. So if for some reason there was some detail in this policy 10 on router 1 which didn't match policy 15 on router 2 then it, it wouldn't negotiate. Okay, it will then fall down to policy 20 and try to negotiate on that. If there wasn't an IC policy that matched between them, then the communicate IC phase one would fail and the IPsec tunnel would never come up. So it would fail at phase one. Okay, so negotiates matching IC policies to protect the IC exchange, so the key of the, the, the key exchange. So <laughs> internet key exchange exchange. Okay, so phase one, second exchange. So this is a little bit of a complex slide. Now, you're not expected to know all this for the CCNA security exam, but basically this is just talking about establishing the Diffie-Hellman key, which uh, involves private and public values being exchanged, going through a certain algorithmic process, and then coming up with the same value on either side to know that everything matches and we're right to go. Okay, so it's a little bit complex. I'll leave that slide in there for your reference, but I'm not going to go through that in any huge amount of detail. Suffice to say, there's private values, public values. They, the um, public values are exchanged, placed through an algorithm with the private value, and then a result is comes out, and if that all matches, then we know that it's good to go. Okay, so that's all we want to say about that. Um, Ike phase one, third exchange. So this authenticates the peer. So this knows, this, this uh, sets up so that 
these, this guy here on the left, this router on the left knows who the guy on the right is, on the right is, and vice versa. Okay, they authenticate to each other, saying I'm router one or I'm router two. Okay, we're good to go. Now they can use pre-shared keys, okay, which are exchanged securely. Uh, RSA signatures or R, what's called RSA encrypted nonces, not nonsense, nonces. So we won't go, we don't need to discuss that in any detail other than to say it is merely an encrypted value that is sent across to, for the purpose of authentication. So it's no different to a pre-shared key or a signature. It's just another method for authentication. Um, heavily mathematically involved, there's no need to go into any detail with that. So once these three exchanges have been done, a bi-directional internet key exchange, security association, SA, becomes established. So that now means we've passed the Ike part of the negotiation, so we've authenticated each other, we've sent some, we've done some key exchange, everything's good to go, I know who you are, you know who I am, we're ready to go, which is now into IPsec. Okay, now, just a, um, so just a note, the previous discussion was around a mode called main mode. Okay, so there's two types of Ike uh, encryption, which I forgot to mention earlier, so apologies for that. First one is main mode, which we've just discussed. Then there's aggressive mode, which saves time. It's a little bit quicker, there's less steps. Okay, so we send the Ike policy set and router one's Diffie-Hellman key, so you can see that's all in one step now. So we just go, here's the, here's the policy set that I want to use and here's my key. Okay, so bang, we're already set in one step. Um, we confirm that policy key from router two and we calculate a shared secret and send router two's Diffie-Hellman key. And then three, the calculate, calculate a shared secret on router one, verify the peer identity and confirm with peer, then we authenticate. Okay, done. So that's phase one out of the way, so you can see it's a step faster. And then in the key, uh, phase two exchange, we then negotiate our IPsec policy. So just a little bit quicker. So like phase two, um, and my slide's a bit out of line there, apologies for that. And um, we negotiate the IPsec security parameters. So again, instead of now talking about an IP parameter, we're now talking about an IPsec parameter. So upon completion, the unidirectional IPsec security associations are established for each protocol and algorithm combination. Now it's important to note that there has to be an IPsec security association in both directions for a tunnel to come up. Okay, so it's not just a security association from router one to router two, there also has to be a security association from router two back to router one. And this is how it basically works in a nutshell. So these are the five steps that we were talking about earlier. So IPsec VPN negotiation. So host A, which in this case is actually, uh, well, host A is this computer here on the left, sends interesting traffic to host B. So interesting traffic, that should already put into your head from previous discussions we've had that uh, about access lists, that in interesting traffic is just traffic that has been matched with an access list that needs to be encrypted. Okay, now in this case it may be everything because it's just a point-to-point -point link between two routers. But it doesn't have to be. It can be a subset of the traffic that you're sending between the two routers can be encrypted and everything else can be in plain text. It depends on your requirements. But in any case, host A, so 10.0.1.3, sends some interesting traffic or attempts to to 10.0.2.3 over here. So router one and router two then negotiate an Ike phase one session as we've just discussed. Okay, so session Ike uh, security association is formed on both sides and we're ready to go. Router one and router two will then negotiate an Ike phase two session which is effectively your IPsec negotiation. Okay, so it negotiates one encryption, what hashing, what uh, lifetime bees we're going to, to use. Okay got an agreement on both sides, the tunnel is now set. The IPsec tunnel now comes up and information, the interesting traffic, is exchanged via that IPsec tunnel um, and optionally in the end the IPsec tunnel can be terminated. 
So it might only be, your tunnel may only be in effect when you're sending interesting traffic or it may in fact be up all the time, as would typically be the case with a point-to-point um, -point VPN, in my opinion. So the first thing is you need to configure compatible ACLs. Okay, so site one over here, site two over there. We need to allow AH, ESP and Ike protocols backwards and forwards across here. So we need to ensure that protocols 50, which is ESP, 51, which is authentication header, and UDP port 500, which is ISACAMP, traffic are not blocked by incoming ACLs on interfaces used by IPsec. So in other words, if we look at, say, serial 000 on each router, if we had an access list, um, because we're connected to the internet, presumably you're going to have access lists on these routers, okay? because in this case we're not using firewalls. So if you were to block everything and only allow certain things out, chances are you're probably going to block ESP, AH and ISACAN. If you were to do that, then your VPN tunnel dies or won't come up. So protocol 50 and 51, now these are values that are worth remembering for your CCNA security exam. ESP, Protocol 50, not port 50, protocol 50. Authentication header, again, is protocol 51, not port. So we're talking about um, actual protocols, not ports. And then ISACAMP runs over UDP protocol, but it uses port 500. Okay, so it's important that you make, the distinguish, you make that distinguishing feature between those three. So if we look at the configuration for this, this is how we would do it. So access list 102, now hopefully you'll remember from our access list week that 102 uh, marks it as a extended IP access list. So we're going to permit uh, AH from host 170.30.2.2 to host 172.30.1.2. Okay, so this is being configured on router 1, so here. So these are the peer addresses. Okay, so access list permit A8 from host 2.2, which is over here, that's router 2, to host router 1.2. So we're allowing authentication header from router 2 to router 1. Then we're also permitting ESP, capsule security payload, and we're permitting UDP where it equals ISACAM. Or you could put um, UDP equals 500 there. And if you put in equals 500, the router will be clever enough to put in ISACAMP in any case. And then we're applying, as we did in our access list uh, tutorial, we're uh, applying that access group in an inbound direction on serial 000, which means that any traffic that's coming into the interface, so from the interface, uh, from the internet into the interface, will have this particular ACL applied to it. And then if we go show access list, this is just the output we're going to get on router 1. Now we need to also provide that on router 2, but the big difference will be the IP addresses will be the opposite way around, because you need to permit it from router 1 to router 2. Okay, so then we need to configure our IKE, so our internet key exchange. And, and we need, again, um, we may not, it may not always show it on the slides, but this, all these configuration has to be done mirror image on second router, okay? So we're talking about re using router one as an example, but all of this configuration also needs to be applied on router two, exactly the same as it is on router one. The only difference is the direction of the access list, okay? So the access list, sorry, the, the IP addresses in the access list must be transposed to suit router two from the perspective of router 2, otherwise the configuration is the same and we'll see that a little bit as we go into our lab. So to configure Ike we use the um, global config command crypto isocamp policy and then priority, okay, that's numeric number. And then we need to define the parameters within the Ike policy. So you can see with this example here we've got crypto isocamp policy 110, uh, so it's just, it doesn't matter what that number is, 110. We're going to use an authentication using pre-shared keys. We're going to use an encryption of DES. We're going to use Diffie-Hellman Group 1. We're going to hash using MD5. And our lifetime is going to be 86,400 seconds. Okay, so that's 24 hours.
Okay, so the ISOCAM parameters, what do they actually mean? And what are the particular values that you can use? So the first parameter encryption, we can use DES, triple DES, AES, AES192 or AES256. Okay, and we can see what that actually means. Default value, um, which I wouldn't recommend you'd use. I would start an absolute minimum of triple DES, but I would probably lean towards AES if you've got uh, devices at the other end that support it. Now if you've got two Cisco routers then there's no problem. If you're going six Cisco router to a checkpoint, Cisco router to a net screen, Cisco or to a Juniper, sorry, uh, to a Symantec, to a Sophos, whatever it is that, that allows you to do, or you, some UTM device that allows you to do your VPN, then you need to make sure that you've got um, the correct protocol set up. So hashing, we've got a uh, values of SHA SHA or MD5, SHA is the default, authentication we can use pre-shared, RSA encrypted or RSA, so encrypted nonces or RSA signatures. Okay, so this is your peer authentication method. For our Diffie-Hellman, for our key exchange, we can use groups 1, 2 or 5, so 768-bit Diffie-Hellman, 1024-bit Diffie-Hellman, 1536-bit Diffie-Hellman. Okay, so by default we'll use 768-bit Diffie-Hellman. And the lifetime, you can specify whatever you like, 86,500 as it says 24 hours, and this is the ISOCAMP established security association lifetime. So every 24 hours it, this, that ISOCAMP security association will have to be renegotiated. And that'll happen without any problems, without bringing the tunnel down or anything, but it just needs to happen. So what happens if there's multiple policies? Well, I'm glad you asked. If there is multiple policies, then they need to go through until they find one that actually ma matches, okay? So for instance, crypto ISOCAM policy 100. Uh, now, the, the, actual, uh, the actual numbers on them are not particularly important. They're shown here as the same just for uniformity, but they don't have to be exactly the same. What does have to be the same, though, is the contents within it. So hash MD5 authentication pre-share. Hash SHA authentication RSA sign signatures, right? Okay, so those guys there match. This one, on the other hand, doesn't because we've got pre-shared over here and we've got RSA sig on this side. So those guys would not work together. That's just an example if there are multiple policies. So policy negotiations. We've got crypto ISOCAMP policy 110, authentication pre-share, triple dares, group 2, hash sha, lifetime 43200. Router 2 must have an ISOCAMP policy configured with the same parameters. And as you can see over here, as I made comment before, this number's not important. Notice how it's still, it's 100. This one's 110, this one's 100, but it'll still work because the actual contents of that policy are the same. Okay, so this allows you to connect to multiple different VPN partners using the same ISOCAMP policy without the numbers having to be the same. Because if the numbers had to be the same, that would be a little bit limiting. So ISOCAMP key, how do we set up our ISOCAMP key? So we use the command crypto ISOCAMP key, keystring address and the peer address or we go keystring host name the host name and that depends on whether you've got DNS resolution set up on your router. So the keystring actually specifies a pre-shared key. You can use any combo of alpha num characters up to 128 bytes in length. And the pre-shared key has to be identical on both peers so it's the same password. It's a pre-shared key so it's a key that I've said to the administrator at the remote end, okay I'm going to plug, I want you to plug this into your router, I'm going to plug it into my router. Okay, done. The peer address, this parameter specifies the IP address of the remote peer. Okay, so it's the IP address of the remote router. So in this case if you were configured on router 1 it would be the IP address of router 2 and vice versa. Uh, and then lastly, uh, hostname, the parameter specifies the hostname of the remote peer. Okay, so again, now the reason you might use hostname is that you might be working with devices that, uh, that either load balance or they may change their IP address. So if you use a hostname, then the IP, it doesn't matter what the underlying IP address is, it should still work.
So the peer address or peer host name can be used but must be used consistently between peers. So you can't have host name on one and IP address on the other one from a, a best practice perspective. If the peer host name is used, then the crypto isocamp identity host, man, host name command must also be configured. Okay, so you don't need to know that much detail in terms of your exam. Just be aware that if you're using host names, you also have to use a crypto isocamp identity host name command. All right, so if we look at a um, example here with respect to our uh, respect to our diagram that we've been working on. So crypto ISOCAM policy 110, we've got all our details in there. <coughs> we've exited back out to global configuration mode. And we've typed in our key. So you can see the ISOCAM policy is done within config ISOCAM mode. Global config, crypto ISOCAM key, Cisco123. Not a particularly good key, but just an example. Um, and then the address of the remote peer. So in this case, this is on router 1. So this would be the remote peer on the internet connected interface on router 2. Conversely on router 2 we would have identical configuration but just the peer address would change. Okay, because no good having the peer address of your own, of yourself on this particular router. So note the key string Cisco1234 matches, the address identity method is specified. Okay, so we've got the IP address, the ISOCAMP policies are compatible default values do not have to be configured. Okay, so for instance, if you want to use group one, Diffie-Hellman, you wouldn't have to put in group one because it's a default. You could if you wanted to, but you wouldn't have to put it in. Then we have to create a transform set. Okay, so the transform set is uh, basically a set of parameters that we're going to use for phase two or IPsec. And the way we do that is here. So crypto IPsec transform set, transform set name, transform one, transform two, transform three. Okay, and we'll see what this means in a minute. So transform set name just specifies the name for that in for that set, that IPsec set that you want to use. The transform one, two, or three is the type of transform set. So you may specify up to four transforms. One AH transform, one ESP transform, one ESP uh, so one ESP encryption, one ESP authentication. These transforms define the IPsec security protocols and algorithms. So this is setting up your, your actual IPsec tunnel. We've gone through phase one, we're now into phase two. And it's just a combination of IPsec transforms that enact the security policy for your traffic. So if we look at what we've got here, Okay, so router 1 and router 2, or well, router 1's IP address has gone a bit crazy up top there. So we've got a number of transform sets here, and notice that the names, again, the names don't have to match. What is important is the actual contents within the particular transform set. So if we look at these ones on the left, we've got transform set alpha is using ESP triple des in tunnel mode. Transform set beta is using ESP triple des or ESP MD5 HMAC, so that's your encryption and your hashing, and we're using tunnel mode. And transform set Charlie uses ESP triple des, HMAC, uh, hashing, and it's in tunnel mode as well. Then on the right hand side we have red, blue and yellow, each with different settings. Now the way that they decide, the way that the routers will determine which transform sets they will use is pretty much just based on negotiation. So it starts from one and it starts from the first transform set that's configured and just goes through the list. So router one would say, alright, well trans transform set alpha, I'll propose that. So trans over here on router two, he says, well no, that doesn't work for me because I've got ESP DES, but you've got ESP triple DES, so that doesn't work. So step two is, all right, router two says, all right, well, I'll try my next transform set. It's Again, it's ESP DES, so it fails there straight away because it doesn't match with the ESP triple DES on this side. So that one doesn't match. Step three, how about your last one? Okay, transform set yellow. Okay, it's ESP triple DES, great. Oh, but hang on, I'm trying to use SHA HMAC hashing but you've got none set on this side, so that that transform set doesn't match. So you see that this one here is first tried on router 1. It doesn't match with any of the three on router 2, so this one is not used. Alpha is not used on router 1. It'll then go down to beta. 
and go through the same process again. Do we have any matches here? No, we don't have any matches anywhere, so it doesn't work. We're not going to use beta. Then we get to Charlie and we go through our match process again. No, it doesn't match with red, it doesn't match with blue, but it does match with yellow. So by the ninth step, in this case the ninth step, we've found a match and we're ready to go. Now it may not take that long, or it could take longer depending on how many transform sets are actually set on your router. So these are nego negated, uh, nego negated, negotiated during the Ike phase two. And the ninth attempt, as we said, found the matching transform sets between Charlie and yellow. So the crypto ACLs. So the crypto ACLs are basically what we're going to decide we're going to send. Okay, so in this diagram here, we've got outbound traffic comes out. The ACL is going to determine whether we're going to encrypt it or whether we're going to just send it, bypass the, the VPN tunnel and just send it via plain text. So remembering router one is connected to the internet, so your basic internet traffic doesn't want to be encrypted because we want to send that out onto the internet and not encrypt it. But any information that we want to send to the remote host or the remote v, over the, uh, to the remote network needs to be encrypted across the VPN tunnel. Similarly with the inbound traffic, we will either permit it based on our ACL list or we'll bypass it, in other words, we just discard it. So the outbound filter, the outbound ACL indicates a data flow to be protected by IPsec. So the outbound ACL indicates the data flow that's going to be protected by IPsec. The inbound ACL will filter and discard traffic that should have been protected by IPsec. So in other words, if you, on, in your inbound traffic, if there's, um, if there's uh, when they find a match, and if it's not encrypted, it will just drop it, because it should have been encrypted. Okay, and our ACL, I won't go through this too much, this slide in detail, it's there for your information, because we've already uh, covered this in depth in week two uh, with our ACLs, uh, so it's basically just the syntax used to create an ACL, and that's no different whether you're using it for encrypting, whether you're using it for cores, route maps, policy maps, whatever, doesn't matter. A thing to note about the ACLs is that they have to be symmetrical. Okay, so apply, if you look at these two ACLs here, ACL applied to router one on the serial interface. Okay, so access list 110 permit TCP from 10.0.1 so that's from this work, uh, this network, to 10.0.2, so that's to this network here. That's applied in the outbound direction on the serial 00 interface. Well, but effectively, effectively it's applied to the encry encrypted tunnel. Okay, so this is the traffic we're going to encrypt between 10.0.1 and 10.0.2. So when you're evaluating the inbound traffic, the source is dot .2, the destination is dot .1. So when it's coming back in this way, source and destination are different because it's a return, it's return traffic, it's bi-directional. Uh, similarly, the ACL that would be applied to router 2, notice how the network addresses have changed, okay, they're reversed, and that's because it's talking about traffic going from router 2 to router 1. So you have to remember that your ACLs have to be a perfect mirror match. If they're not a perfect mirror match right down even to the protocol level or the port level, then the, the traffic won't get across that VPN tunnel. It'll be discarded at one end or the other. It's very, very important that the access lists are direct mirror images of each other. And that is, but that is only with respect to source and destination. So what is source and destination on one side will be the reverse on the other. So then once we've created our ACLs, um, we then apply the crypto map. And what this means, basically means is that we're going to define the ACLs to be used, we've defined the remote VPN peers, we've defined the transform set to be used, we've defined the key management method, and we've defined the SA lifetimes. And then we need to apply that crypto map 
to the interface or sub-interface on your router, so in this case 0000, and then that traffic will then be encrypted between the two sites. Until you apply that crypto map to the interface, doesn't matter what other configuration you've done, nothing will be encrypted. And we do that this way. So crypto map, map, map name, sequence number, IPsec manual or IPsec ISOCAM or dynamic, which you don't really need to know too much about. And these are the parameters here. Now I'll let you go through those in more detail because I want to push on and make sure that we get to the lab. But just take a moment to pause and have a look at the syntax and just what each of these things does specifically. So the crypto map config mode command. So once we've as back in this slide, once we've actually created our crypto map, you notice this is in router config mode. Once we've created our crypto map, we will then drop into actual crypto map uh, configuration mode. And you'll see that in the lab shortly. And there's a number of different commands there that set up our crypto map. Okay, and again, we'll look at that in more detail shortly. So if we look at this one, just a quick example, crypto map, my map, sequence number 10, IPsec isocamp, so it's an IPsec isocamp crypto map. We're going to match address 110, so that would be our ACL, we can't see it in this configuration, but we assume that there's a, a IP extended access list 110, which is defining interesting traffic for this particular uh, VPN tunnel. We're then going to set the peer to 172.30.2.2, so that's router 2 over here as a default peer, and we're going to set router 3 as a backup peer. We're going to set PFS, which is perfect forward secrecy, group 1. We're going to set the transform set called mine, so the transform set's called mine, so not particularly descriptive, and we're going to set the SA lifetime to 24 hours. And it says multiple peers can be specified for redundancy. We then assign the crypto map set, so configuration interface, so we go into serial 000, and we just simply type in crypto map my map, and then the, the crypto will start. When there's interesting traffic, the crypto VPN tunnel will be initiated. Again, just applies crypto map to the outgoing interface, and activates the policy. So CLI commands of interest. We have show crypto map, so that these will help with your troubleshooting or verification of your configuration. So we have show crypto map, show crypto isocamp policy, show crypto IPsec SA, so security association, show crypto IPsec transform set, debug crypto isocamp and debug crypto IPsec. Now as with any commands that you run, always be careful running the debug commands in particular because they can generate a lot of traffic depending on how many tunnels you've got set up on your router and how much traffic flows across those tunnels. Um, your show crypto map, isocamp policy, IPsec SA and the transform set will show you different details about your particular uh, crypto, the status of your actual crypto tunnel to show whether it's actually up and whether it's actually working. So if we were to have a look at some of these, so if we go show crypto map, you'll see a number of pieces of information which are quite useful. So crypto map, my map, sequence number, and then the type of my map it is, it'll have your peer, it'll have the extended IP, so it'll have the uh, um, access list that you're matching on, and actual details about what's in that access list. It'll set the current peer, the security association lifetime, and all the other details about it which we've already looked at. ISOCAMP policy, again, these show the policies that are actually on your router. It doesn't necessarily show that the, uh, same as the last one, it doesn't necessarily show that the tunnel's up, it'll show you the configuration that you've got on your router. Okay, much as a show run would, but in this case is a little bit more information there, it's a little bit easier to read than it is uh, sometimes in the configuration, particularly if you have a lot of policies. Uh, so show crypto IPsec transform set, so this obviously shows your phase 2 uh, transform sets here, so we're using ESP128 AES, ESP SHA HMAC in tunnel mode. But here, this is an important one because this will show you 
whether your crypto is up or not. So we've got show crypto IPsec SA. So as we've seen, as we've gone through, if you have a security association at the IPsec level, so IPsec being phase two, then everything should be good in the main and you should be um, communicating across your encrypted tunnel. So we can see here local address 172.30.1.2 um, and we're sending to our remote identity, so our remote peer 172.30.2.2. The current peer is router 2 as we've seen. Packets encapsulated 21, packets encrypted 21, packets de-encapsulated, packets decrypted 21. Okay, so it's showing that there's traffic going out. So that would look good, and and if you sh if you match that up with a similar command on router two, you'll get a good idea of what's actually going on. So debug crypto isocamp. So just this particular error message here is an example of what's called a main mode error message. You don't need to know a whole in a whole lot of depth. Uh, the failure of main mode suggests that the phase one policy does not match on both sides. So remember, I was talking about before you've got isocamp. I, the key exchange, uh, main, there's two types, main mode and aggressive mode. Okay, so it's saying process processing of main mode failed with a peer. Okay, so it says security association not acceptable. So what it's basically saying is we don't have a matching phase one policy. So you need to verify that that phase one policy is set on both peers and ensure that all the all the attributes match. So it could be just something really simple like it said the Diffie-Hellman group one on one side and Diffie-Hellman group three on the other or something similar to that. So you just need to make sure that all everything is identical. If everything's identical, then you should be okay in terms of encryption. So implementing remote access. So just quickly, we need to go through this. Um, number of different ways. Dial-up modem, the thing of the past. DSL modem, you can set up those certainly. Cable modems, satellite modems, okay. It's again just your remote access. So we're now talking about uh, yeah, remote access rather than point-to-point. Uh, -point, right? So SSL VPNs are now a big part of remote uh, the remote access VPN strategy for Cisco. So it integrates security and routing. It's browser-based, giving you full network SSL VPN access. Okay, with uh, non-withstanding those caveats we had in our table before. Okay, there are some applications that are not going to work over an SSL VPN, but it is one of the options that you can use along with AnyConnect. So basically, this just same as no different to using a, a VPN browser. It creates an SSL tunnel through a browser over the internet to your uh, router or firewall, uh, which you would authenticate through to, and then after that you would be presented with some sort of portal uh, where you could launch your applications inside your workplace. And appear as, you know, get a, a fairly uh, respectable look and feel as if you're actually there. So types of access. Um, Moving further on, we've got our. This is our first one, so we've got our clientless SSL VPN, which we can use from supply partners, public terminals. This is straight out of a Cisco document, um, a Cisco product document. Uh, so that's our clientless VPNs, and then we have our client-based SSL or IPsec VPN. Now, client-based, so our IPsec VPN um, could be a point-to-point, -point or it could be our AnyConnect. So establishing an SSL session for our SSL VPN, we're using an SSL client, so typically a web browser. User makes a connection to port 443 TCP. Router applies with a digital signed public key. You can read that. User software creates shared key, shared secret key encrypted with public key of the service sent to the router. Bulk encryption occurs. Okay, so that's a fairly well-known, straightforward uh, communications process. But take a little bit of time just becoming familiar with the steps here because uh, there's a, a, an understanding of it is useful for your exam moving forward. So Cisco VPN, Easy VPN negotiates the tunnel parameters, establishes tunnels according to set parameters, automatically creates a NAT pat and associated ACL, so sounds too good to be true, authenticates users by usernames, group names and passwords, 
manages security keys for encryption and decryption, authenticates encrypts and decrypts data through the tunnel. Wow. So it pretty much does everything for you. So a PC with Cisco Easy VPN remote client on it, going to a iOS software Easy VPN server. Again, a little bit, uh, a little bit of an old diagram. Um, so it pretty much does, and that's all I really want to say about VPN remote client um, or Easy VPN. Basically, it's a nice point and click method to set up a, a VPN very quickly, very easily. So, and then it goes through this particular communications process to secure the VPN. And it seems a bit redundant of that because a VPN is secure inherently. Um, so we do our phase one. We establish our ISA camp. We accept the proposals. We have usernames and passwords. System parameters pushed. Reverse route injection adds a static route to say, okay, come this way now for all your traffic. And then we'll negotiate the phase two and we set up our IPSEC Security Association and away we go. Okay, so our Packet Tracer Lab. Let's have a look at our Packet Tracer Lab. So this is our Packet Tracer Lab that we're going to have a look at. So the idea is basically that we're going to, we've got three topologies in our router, in, in our router, three topology, three um, routers in our topology. And we're going to set up a VPN tunnel between router one here and router three. Router two is going to, is merely going to act as a uh, transit area for traffic. And that's about all it's going to do. So it's not going to have any view of the encrypted traffic whatsoever. It is merely going to sit there and route, route packets for us. So if we have a look at, I'll just bring across the activity sheet so you can see what I, what we're going to do. So it's got all the IP addresses set out. Again, you'll be familiar with these because you'll have used the packet shaper labs as it is anyway. So you can see these are the, uh, the phase one which we've been talking about, our ISACAMP phase one policy parameters that we're going to use. So we're going to use ISACAMP for key distribution, we're going to use AES for encryption, SHA-1 for a hash, pre-shared keys, Diffie-Hellman 2 for key exchange, 24-hour Ike SA lifetime, and that's our key there, VPN PA55. Then for our phase two policy, so our IPsec, we're going to use the transform set name VPN set, the peer host name will be R3 and R1, the peer IP address will be thus, the networks to be encrypted, the crypto map name, and the session, the SA Security Association Establishment. Okay, so let's just pop that out of the way for a second. And we'll have a look at what we actually need to do. So if we go, let's start with router one. Actually, the first thing we'll need to do, if I know the labs, will be to actually ping. Okay. So from here, let's just check that we can actually, that we've got routing up and running. So if we ping across to PCC, so 192.168.3.3. Just to ensure that we've got routing. Again, we just need to wait for our ARP. And there we go. Okay, so we've got connection from PC1. So here, all the way through the router across to PCC. Okay, so now we go to router 1 and we're going to start our configuration. Okay, let's just make that, just close that. Sorry guys, I'll just make this um, a little bit bigger. Options, preferences, where is it, font, there it is. Okay, I'll make that a bit bigger for you so you easier to see. Apply that. Let's have a look. There we go, that's a bit better. Okay, so Cisco Con, whoops, I think I've typed that wrong. Cisco Con PA55 and enable password Cisco EN PA55 
Okay. So we need to be in general comp phone. Now the first thing we're going to do is to configure an ACL which will define our interesting traffic. Now I've got it here in front of me in terms of the actual network diagram so I know what we're looking at but if we just jump back here, so from router 1 we want to encrypt anything that's on the 192.168.1 network through to the 192.168.3 network. Okay, so our access list to do that is fairly straightforward. So we're going to go access list uh, 110, permit IP 192.168.1.0 with a wildcard mask 0.0.0.255 and we're going to 192.168.3.0 wildcard mask 0.0.0.255. Okay, so there's our access list done. Okay, we're then going to configure our ISOCAMP Phase 1 policies um, based on uh, the information we had before in our table. So I've got that sitting here in front of me, so I can type that away. So we would go crypto ISOCAMP policy and we'll call it 10 uh, encryption AES. What else we got? Authentication pre-share and we're using Diffie-Hellman group 2. What else we got? Anything else? Uh, let's see, what else we got on the sheet? Diffie-Hellman 2, show oh, got that. Okay. Excellent. Now, there are some other options we can push in. So we can put in our hash, okay, we can put in SHA because that was uh, what we had to do. However, I'll show you something in a minute. The other thing we can put in is lifetime, which was I think from memory was 24 hours, was it not? It was 86400. Okay, now if we just do a do show run, oops, we can have a look. You'll notice that it hasn't put in what I've put in for either the hashing algorithm or the lifetime. And the reason is because they're defaults. Okay, so it doesn't worry about it. So that's what I was saying before, you don't have to put in if you don't want to. Okay, uh, so that's our ISOCAMP. Now we need to configure our uh, ISOCAMP phase two, which is basically our transform step. So this is determining what uh, we get what actual IPsec parameters we're going to be using. So we would type in crypto IPsec transform, whoops, I can't spell, sorry guys, transform set, uh, had to be called VPN hyphen set, I do believe, yes, ESP dash three triple Z, and we're going to use SHA H Mac. Done. So there's our IPsec transform map. Now we need to configure, what have I missed, what have I missed, what have I missed? Oh, we've got to configure the crypto map, the crypto map of course. Then create, okay, that's it. I thought I'd forgotten a step, silly me. Okay, so we have to do the crypto map as well. So what are the settings for the crypto map? We need crypto map, uh, map, it's got to be called VPN hyphen map, 10 IPsec, isocamp.crypto map. Okay, so now it's just, it brings up a message which says this will remain disabled until you've got a valid peer in there, okay, which is fair enough. So it's saying I'm not going to do anything until you tell me who I'm going to connect to. So I'll put in uh, a description, just because it makes it nice and readable later on. We're going to set our peer to 10.2.2.2, just let me check that. Yep, 2. We're going to set the transform set, so in other words this is the IPsec encryption we want to uh, use. So the VPN set, which is this here, that's what we created up there, so that ties that together. And then we're going to match address 110, because that's our um, access list that we created 
a little bit earlier. So now that we've done the crypto map and the transform set and we've got everything else up and going, we then need to apply that. Aha, actually, there is one other thing I've forgotten, sorry. We need to type in the isocamp key, so the phase one key. So crypto isocamp key, which was VPN PA55, and for the address, 10.2.2.2, done. So now we have a key. Now the last thing we need to do, so we've created everything, let's just have a look. So we've got our isocamp policy, it should all be in one section, there we go. So we've got our phase one stuff here, okay. We have our phase two stuff there. We have our crypto map, so what we're actually going to encrypt and who we're going to encrypt it to is set there. The last thing we need to do is apply that to the outbound interface, which in this case is serial 000. And that's really the simplest part of the whole lot. So 000, we type in uh, crypto map VPN hyphen map. Okay, so now we have Isocamp on. So if we go to show crypto, let's pick one, what are we going to do? Let's have Isocamp policy. There we have our policy. So we're using AES, SHA, pre-shared key, Diffie Allen Group 2, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so all our information is there. But that's not that's telling us what we're using, what we're going to use, it doesn't tell us whether anything's actually up. So if we go show Crypto Isocamp SA, we're going to get nothing, okay, at the moment, because we haven't configured our router 3. So at the moment, this guy is sitting there um, quite happily, but uh, nothing's going to happen. Now if we go back to our PCA at the moment, and we run a command, we run our ping again, let's see what happens. Now notice now it just completely times out. The reason behind that is because if we look at our router 1, okay, so we have our ping going in the background here, we have our router going there. If we go debug, what will we do? Let's go debug crypto, what do we reckon? Let's have a look at Isocamp. Okay, let's send our ping again see what happens. So you can see it's trying to send a ping out, cannot start aggressive mode, trying main mode. So by default it'll try the quick method, if that doesn't work it'll try the slow method. Um, nothing's happening, sending packet 10.2.2, .2, my port 500, peer port 500, so in other words using UDP port 500, so that's Ike. Um, and we're saying no state. Okay, so I can't get there, and that's because we haven't configured the router on the other side. So the ping won't work, so we've, we've said from now on we want everything, so if we have a look at, so if we just turn debugging off, and we have a look at the access list, uh, you can see there's been matches, okay, from 192.168.1 to 192.168.3, that's great, but we can't, because it's being matched, it's trying to encrypt it, but at the other end, the router at the other end, router 3 doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about, so nothing will happen. Okay, so now, let's go to router 3, and configure it the same way, and we'll see what happens. Oop. It help if I got the password right. Okay, so now we're in router 3. So now we have to go through those same steps again to configure our router 3. Remembering the only difference needs to be the uh, order of the statements, or the order of the source and destination, sorry, the changing of the source and destination between, uh, on the access list. That's all we need to do. Okay, so let's have a look. Bear with me for a sec while I just get some of my configuration together. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is assign our access list. 
So this time we'll say access list 110, permit, this time it's got to be around the other way, so it's 192.168.3.0 because we're coming from the opposite side, to 192.168.1.0. Okay, so there's our access list done. We then need to create our phase one. So let's call it again, keep it the same, encryption policy 10. This time I'm not going to worry about doing the Diffie, help, oh, sorry, the um, hashing or lifetime because we already know that they're defaults, so they're already there as we would want them to be. So group two. We're going to create our crypto key, so that would be crypto isocamp key, what was it, uh, VPN PA55. This time the address has got to be of the remote peer, which is 10.1.1.2 this time. Um, we need the transform set for, uh, whoop, 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 whoop. we need the transform set, set uh, VPN set ESP. P triple dares, I think, from memory. If it doesn't work, we will get a good example of transforming. Hello, what have I done there? Ah, left out the IP set keyword. Idiot. Okay, um, we need the crypto map. So VPN map uh, ten. It's an IP sec isocamp. Again, okay. We're not going to do anything. So description. What I say? VPN. Connection to R1, uh, we're going to set the peer 10.1.1.2, we're going to set the transform set of VPN set, is that what I called it? Yes, and we're going to match on address 110, excellent. Now the only other thing we need to do is apply it to the interface, now hang on, which interface is it? Not sure, so let's do a do show int do show IP int brief. Yep, zero zero one. Okay, so we're trying to pop it onto here. Okay, and then it's a crypto map VPN map. So now if I haven't forgotten a step, if we go show crypto uh, ice camp, thank you, SA. Okay, nothing there yet. Let's have a look at uh, what else we've got. We have a look at our policy. Okay, so let's see how we go. So if we were to debug crypto ice camp. And we go back to PC1. Now while I've, I'll just have router 3 open there for a second so we can see if anything happens. Okay, here we go. You can see some, um, and there we go, we've got our ping up. So we've obviously got our crypto up and going. So if we look at our uh, debug output here, we can see sending a packet 10.1.1.2. So this is so this is UDP port 500, so this is our IC phase one, okay, um, got some got some backwards and forwards, so then he's received on port 500, coming back, false real, okay, QM's done, that actually says, you know, false, error, false, no, there's no error, um, IC exchange, phase two complete. Okay, so phase two, once you see that phase two complete, you know that you have got um, encryption up and running. So if we were to go show um, crypto isocamp SA, there we go. Okay, so the QM idle state here just means that it's ready waiting. Okay, so we've got our destination 10.1.1.2, our source 10.2.2.2. Okay, and we're active. If we were to go to, I'll just square that up a bit. Then we'll go across to, we'll get router one up here as well. I thought I would, but it doesn't want to come up. There we go, router one, there he is. 
and we'll just tile these a little more effectively so that we can see the output and if we go show crypto isocamp SA and see now we've got the direct mirror okay don't worry the connection ID is unimportant what is important though is that the status of both is active which you can't see on this one but just no if I just move it across a little bit and then make it a little bit wider you'll see it's active similarly if we go show crypto IP sec SA you'll see here that we've got outbound established security associations inbound established security associations so that's telling us that we have our IPsec up and running so not only have we passed phase one we've passed phase two as well and you can also see here we've got packets being encrypted and decrypted <coughs> excuse me so everything's working just fine um, just in the last few minutes if we were to go back into our configuration and let's just have a look at the run. I'll just give you, I just want to show you an example of a couple of things. So if we were to remove this particular crypto set here, okay, so we'll remove that. Oh, we've got to remove the transform set. Okay, um, easy way to do it. Raise, reload. Okay, so we'll go back and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change one of the parameters in the IP set transform set for a start. Ah, do I do that? Okay, so just bear with me for a sec. I'll get my saved config from my router. So I'm going to paste my config in other than uh, other than the actual crypto. Yep. Because I just want to demonstrate um, just want to be able to demonstrate some of the some of the debug commands for you. Okay, done. So now we're going to go back and we're going to do our crypto. But this time I'm going to make a couple of, I'm going to make an error for a start. And I want you to tell me, I want you to see if you can spot what the errors are before I tell you. Okay, so we're just going to cut and paste this back on. Got our encryption here. Uh, and we're going to go into int zero one. Ah, what was it? On there, and we're going to go crypto map VPN map. Okay, so we've got our map up and running again. So let's have a look. We've got our crypto SA. Okay, inbound and outbound, that's interesting, isn't it? So we go back, we go to our PC, we route. What do we got? Okay, what's going on here? We have an error message. Message from Mike has no SA and is not initialization officer. Okay, IPsec pallet has IPsec packet has invalid SPA. Okay, so there's something not right there, isn't it? So let's um, clear IPsec. Uh, clear crypto IPsec what am I doing here? Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, there you go. Well, well, that's messed it up, that is. All right, so let's write, ma'am. So what it's basically saying here, if we have a look at um, show crypto IPsec, oops, IPsec SA, what have we got? Notice we've got no inbound and outbound. Okay, so everything looks okay. So what have we done wrong? Let's have a look at our... So the answer is already there in front of you. Let's have a look at it again. Let's have a look at the error message again. Okay, so it says Ike message. The Ike message has no SA. So Ike Internet Key Exchange means Phase 1. So something's wrong with Phase 1. Something's wrong with our Phase 1. So what could that be? If we have a look at our Phase 1, let's go to Show Run, we can see that there's a difference in the policy. Okay, so Crypto OSCAM Policy 10, Encryption AES, Authentication Pre-Share, but we've got no Group 2. So that means our Diffie-Hellman group is different. By default, if we do our Show Crypto ISOCAMP Policy, we'll see here that it's using Diffie-Hellman Group 1. So because the it's Diffie-Hellman Group 2 on Router 1, and just to prove that, uh, Policy, Diffie-Hellman Group 2, Diffie-Hellman Group 1. Because they're using different groups, different key lengths, not going to work. Okay, so the easiest way, to, easy way to fix that, easy way to fix that. Post Group 2. Now, we should be able to establish Okay, so now something else is wrong. So what's going on here, do we think? So it says received IP separate, there's invalid SPI. Okay, protocol 50. Okay, that's our Ike. Not quite sure what's wrong there. So let's have a look at our, let's have a look at our run. Is there something else that we've maybe missed? So again, it's just, it's good to be able to Debug. Okay, and it's just so there's some mistakes in here that we've made, so you can see what's going on. Okay, so our ice camp policy matches, our transform set, and our passwords match. Transform set matches, our crypto, our peer addresses match. Match one ten. Okay. Crypto map. Okay, got 3.1, 1.3, the access list. Okay, everything looks okay. So what could that be? Let's see what happens if we reload our routers. And this I'm just I'm doing this deliberately just to make a point with this here. Can I wait until our routers come up? Ah, fat fingers. Okay, let's see what happens. Our CryptoSec PSA. Okay, so we can see that we have a IPsec SA running. And we have an inbound one running. So what do we think is going on here? Uh, what am I doing? 3.3. Okay, that guy can ping him. 
that guy can ping him. So what do we think is going on here? Okay, so I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that for you guys to answer on the forum as the last thing you need to do coming into your exam. Okay, so I'll, what I'll do is I will post uh, the configs and the uh, configs in the lab up on Moodle for you to have a look at, and I want you to see if you can work out what's happening particularly in that last place. Okay, so I've given you all the commands you need to be able to work out what's going on. I just want you to, I'll just uh, save that as, so I'll do this, I'll save this as a, a different file name. Uh, complete. Okay, and I'll let you uh, have a look at that. Okay, so that's the end of our labs, and that is in effect the end of our MOOC. So next week you will have the test, okay, um, for the MOOC completion certificate. So it's a 50 question multiple choice test. You, it will cover the content of the last five weeks. So our first week, our basically our uh, security primer, our IPsec, our firewall, uh, IPsec, our ACLs, our firewall, our intrusion prevention and detection from last week, and our VPN for this week. There will be approximately 10 questions on each week. There may be one or two weeks which might have 11 or 12 questions, depending on how much uh, information was actually covered in that week. But there's about 10 questions per, sec, uh, per, per week topic. Uh, I believe from memory it's around about 70%. Uh, you have to get a mark of 70% or higher to earn the certificate of completion. There are no distinctions or high distinctions or anything like that. It's just 70% pass mark, simple as that. So don't get, but don't get, look, it, it, honestly, in my opinion, don't get too caught up um, with the actual certificate or the test itself. It's not that important in terms of it's not going to earn you a CCNA security uh, certification. It's merely to give you an idea of how well you've been able to absorb the information we've presented over the last five weeks and how you're able to uh, take that info, take the data that I've given you and, and form it into information allowing you to secure uh, Cisco um, iOS devices using the topics that we've discussed. Okay, so it's not the be all and end all from any means and you know don't feel too bad if you don't do too well on the exam. Uh, by the same token, if you get 100% on the exam, that's great, but it may not be any 100% indication of how you'll go on the CCNA security exam if you were to actually go and complete it because there's a lot of um, topics, a lot of topics that we haven't covered which are covered on the CCNA exam, and of course, you know, you can only cover so much in uh, in a five-week course. So good luck. I hope you do really, really well. I hope, I really hope you've enjoyed uh, this uh, five-week MOOC as much as I have enjoyed presenting it. And I would encourage uh, all of you to enrol in our CCNA networking. MOOC if you would also like to look at that, but we've also got a number of other MOOCs on the IT Masters website, free courses uh, which run, you know, there's usually one a month, run quite regularly on a number of different topics and they'll give you a bit of a look, a bit of an insight into the way IT Masters run their um, Masters programs. So by all means, uh, catch up with as many of those as you would like. As I said, good luck with the exam next week. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you've uh, gained as much out of it as, uh, as, as I have. I've had a lot of fun presenting um, and I wish you all the best in your ongoing careers. Uh, until next time, good night and uh, good luck next week. Thanks.